Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp. Hey, call us Rich Gear here with you. And uh, this week, Doug, I guess we're going to continue a little bit on the chronology and the timeline. And the it's Old important Testament about, timeline. Old timeline. Testament timeline, yes. And we're uh, covering the, <laughs> the period between Noah and Abram. And uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, good information that the Bible has concerning the, the timeline of, of the uh, the chronology here. There's really no dispute amongst uh, the chronologers about uh, this particular period. The only ones who would dispute those who don't don't accept at face value the, the figures given in the scriptures pretty right. much. And there are some discrepancies for those who take the Septuagint version which adds about mm -hmm. a thousand years on the chronology. But most people who take the Hebrew text uh, come uh, the actual st not, uh, sum of the number of years is identical. I, there's really no, no dispute. The starting point sometimes varies. <laughs> we talked about that last time. Uh, but very, you know, you've basically got a, maybe a 500-year approximate uh, variance between the starting point to the other ones when you're dealing with BC dates and, and, and that kind of stuff. But the actual sum of years, if you start from year zero or year one, depending on how you calibrate it, is pretty much the same. You get it with 1656, year 1656, at the year of the flood. No, okay. Right. No, was 600 years old at that time. But what's interesting is you have to, then there's like a, a, a break between, you see, there's like 10, there's a list of like 10 patriarchs, you know, from Adam to Noah. Mm -hmm. And then between Noah, and we talked about this again last week, we'll just reprise it slow, uh, quickly. And it seems like if you read just the text at face value, that Noah had triplets. Suddenly Noah was 500 years old and he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, but when you really read the text, and uh, uh, Morrow, the book I got here, Wonders of Bible Chronology, uh, Martin Anstey, who was the first one, he said, the genius of Archbishop Usher figured this one out, how, how what happened. And it's not really difficult. When you see it, it's like, oh, that makes total sense. Because what it tells you, a few chapters down there, is that when uh, Arphax said, who was the son of Shem, who was the son of Noah, Arphax is born two years after the flood, Shem was 100 years old. Mm -hmm. So when you take that into account, you realize that Noah would have been 502, Shem would have been 98 years old at the time of the flood. So Noah would have had to have been 502 because he was 600 years old at the time of the flood. All that information is given in the scripture, not to be too com convoluted or complicated about it. So then you can get the connecting link between the first 10 patriarchs, and then you go from Shem all the way down to Abram. And, and we'll get to we'll get to Abram. You find out there's a very similar kind of a break there too, right. and that's that's also been solved. Now, who was the oldest, Shem, Ham, or Japheth? Japheth was probably the elder. And it actually says Genesis. Uh, the the authorized version says it pretty well that the the elder, the the Japheth, the elder. And uh, we pretty much most most biblicists believe that Japheth was the oldest. Shem was probably. Uh, he's either, he could have been the youngest or the middle child. A lot of people think that Ham was the youngest. Uh, I don't really know if it gives that, that, that particular, no, it really does not give that information. What it does say is that Japheth is the oldest, and, but, but the chronology is reckoned from Shem, not Japheth. In the Creation Truth Conference that I just uh, went to, yep. uh, they had, did a lot of, with the biblical chronology, and one of the things that I found was very interesting was that uh, uh, a lot of the people in England, including the Queen, can trace their heritage way back to Charlemagne. Now, what the, they don't tell you, but the, which is true, is Charlemagne uh, uh, has had his uh, chronology uh, traced all the way back to Adam. Yeah, and I wonder how you do that. That's amazing. Well, Bill Cooper in his book talks about this. Yeah, Bill Cooper is after the flood. That's a book I I highly recommend. It it really it, it's amazing. But he talks about if. And we were talking before we actually started the show tonight how it's almost if the Bible is confirmed by some outside reference, they, they discount it. They, they basically have to almost have three outside references. But Bill Cooper takes, he has several. They'll, and, and, and there'll be a break in one, uh, let's see, if it's the Brits or the Italians or the, or the, uh, the uh, Norwegian or the, or the Caucasus, you know, he'll take different genealogies and they'll break at different points, but they'll overlap with other ones right. as they go to different places. And they, and they do, they go back all the way. So it is possible to trace it back, but modern secular thinking pretty much ignores it. 
or right, or disparages right. it or ridicules it or just basically just because their 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 a priori assumption is the Bible is wrong or mythological, mm -hmm. they won't accept that it's real. But the evidence is really there, in uh, in so many ways that this this is these uh, these chronologies and these these lineages are right. Uh, what's very interesting, Doug, is the Bible only takes one lineage. Again, we talked about that last right. week, and the reason why that is because eventually it's going to go all the way to Messiah. What's very interesting is right now in the first part of Genesis, the first ten patriarchs and the next ten, you're dealing with individuals. Right. And they're long, they're, they live pretty long ages, and there's fairly long numbers. When you've got the first ten from Adam to, to, uh, to Noah, you have like ten patriarchs. you got 656 years. It's a big, long number. It's pretty... Pretty straightforward, and then in the and then and the next one you have a, another set which is which is less, uh, but you're dealing with individuals, and then uh, it gets a little complicated. We're not there yet, and we will mm -hmm. get there. But when you get into the Joseph and Moses, and there's breaks there, and then Moses to the judges, it gets real tricky because what happens is you're going from individuals who are the direct line of Jesus, and I think the Lord Bible does this on purpose. Then you go to a family, Abraham. Mm -hmm. And then you go to a nation. Right, yeah. Okay? And then when the nation gets summed up in its kings, it can, tends to go back to individuals again. For the line yeah, of Judah. Right. And that's very kind of really cool. I never thought about that really until just a night. I was taught, thinking about it. I go, yeah, that's why it did that. And that's why it gets a little tricky when, when you get to Joseph, the break between Joseph and, 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 uh, and Moses. Because it starts going through Moses and the, and, and the nation there. And uh, after, after Joseph... And then, and then the judges and all that kind of stuff. But we're not going to go there yet. We want to talk about some of the stuff going from from uh, from Shem down to Abram. So, Doug, there's a list I've got here, and we can get the, if you want to read the list off. Okay. It, it's, well, before before uh, we do that, you got something going on? Yeah, one, one thing I want to uh, mention is that on our, our website, which is rae.org, yeah, you can go to the books sec section. Mm -hmm. uh, there, and I just put out there a, a new page, which makes it a little bit easier to find. Mm -hmm. There's a link to Bill Cooper's After the Flood book. Oh, good. And it's totally online, so you can read it, the, oh, the it whole really? thing online. It's a great book. It's an easy read, too. Yeah, but it's, it's worth, worthwhile it's checking very out, worthwhile. Uh, uh, you know, either in the e-format or, or uh, in the paper copy. The man spent 25 years doing the research on this. And it's, a, it's an incredible thing. Picked up something I never even knew existed. It's very, very, very powerful. So after, uh, after Noah, we have Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But uh, uh, how does it sort of cascade down, uh, down to Abraham? What's interesting is that Japheth is the oldest. He gets the, the prophecy from Noah says, you will enlarge your tents. And Bill Cooper's book, again, shows how the lineage of Japheth goes all over the world. Where the Hamitic and Semitic generally stayed around the Middle Eastern area, there's some exceptions. They went out to, to, to India and uh, to Africa area, in the African area, but generally the, the Middle Eastern area is where they st they, they stayed. Where Japheth, their descendants went everywhere. Nevertheless, the Bible takes Shem, or the Semitic line, to do the chronology from. Okay, and so what happens? It, 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 it's really interesting because these other people did all kinds of things, probably in the world, and there's records of them historically and and, and uh, whatnot. But uh, Shem's descendants, a lot of them were sheep herders, and you don't really, I mean, including Abraham himself. When we get to him, you don't really read a lot about them. And in fact, a lot of the times you've got just a, the the characters are just a couple lines, or even basically all they did was, again, like the first ten patriarchs. You know, they lived, and then they had kids, and then they died. You know what I'm saying? But the particular ones they had, you said, so, um, you know, Noah, Noah's age at the time of the flood, he was 600 years old. Um, and so, basically, he had 98 years to that. Uh, that gets you Shem's age. Mm -hmm. Then from Shem, he basically had, he has his son two years after the flood when he's 100 years old. Very clear, Genesis tells you that. So that, that would be the year 1658. 1656 was the, was the year that, of the flood. Mm -hmm. All right? So then, uh, uh, Arafax had has Selah after, he's 35, after 35 years. Okay? So now we're at 1693. Then Eber, who's an interesting guy, because he doesn't really talk a lot about it, but pretty much most scholars believe that Eber is where we get the word Hebrew from. Yeah. He's the, he's the ancestor of the Hebrew race, of the Hebrew people, okay? Because the Semitic line 
you have Assyrians, you have a lot, you basically you have all kinds of people, uh, all kinds of people groups, okay? And then from Eber you have Peleg. Now Peleg is an interesting character, Doug. And Peleg is born when Eber is 30 years old. So what's interesting now is you're, you're finding out the, the lifespans of these people are also getting shorter. Mm -hmm. We've talked about that many times in the, in the flood. Before the flood, it was almost universally 900 years plus. Uh, there were a couple of exceptions we talked about. But after the flood, Arphaxad lives only, you know, well, Shem lives 600 years. I think 600, and, yeah, I think 600 he dies. Mm -hmm. So he lives 350 years, well, a shorter time period than his father Noah, who lived to be 950. Okay. And Noah lived up uh, almost to the time of Abraham. He did. I think he was. I think Abraham was fifty years old before Noah died. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, I haven't looked at that recently, but I believe he was definitely alive. Uh, Shem was definitely alive, but Shem uh, was six hundred. Then Arphaxad was four hundred and thirty-four. I think so when he died. Uh, and we can look that up if, in the, in the scriptures. But he so lifespans are beginning to decrease here. Now there's a reason for that. Yeah, go and, for it. And the, and the the reason is that. Uh, uh, in my mind is that the environment after the flood was uh, significantly different and yeah. uh, and uh, there would have been uh, some of the cosmic rays would have been able to, from the, the sun would have been able to penetrate the earth's atmosphere and this is a, a little bit of the vestiges of the old canopy theory yeah but, but I also the, believe I also believe that that the lineage we had a bottleneck we have a genetic bottleneck right. as well uh, you know, when, when God created Adam and Eve, he made it perfect. So for two people, you could have all kinds of variation. But we know now, when you interbreed too much, it causes problems down the road. This was actually not an issue as much back in those days, but there was still not as much uh, variety after the flood. You had knocked down to eight people, all right? Mm -hmm. And we've talked, we talked last week about what if there was a... And I think your environment issue is a very good argument because John Sanford in the, uh, in the conference we were just in, in, in says that uh, with each, in each generation there are, there are a hundred new genetic mutations. That's yeah, that's what I was getting. And, at. Uh, that's uh, Kondrashoff's question: is why aren't we dead one hundred times over? Over. That's exactly right. If yeah, see, I tell those people in a second. They look, we believe Adam and Eve were two real people, but we believe God created them perfect. You have to figure out why do ape like hominids, not only could they have come become a male and a female at the same time, but why with all the inbreeding we are all genetically dead, 100,000 times over, with especially the, the, the deep time you put in there. We have, a, we have an outside source that created us perfect, and it was broken, but not totally defunct. In, and, in and this is probably one of the uh, most um, uh, compelling arguments against evolution that you can ever think of. It's not going upward, it's going downward. It's going and downward, and, yes. And uh, you can believe in devolution, but there's no magic little uh, natural selection that goes out uh, there and, uh, and picks the best of all the, uh, all the, all the genes. Yeah, that's and magic and realism. Yeah. But Doug, what, what I want to get with the mutation and the environment, Jerry Bergman awakened my mind to the fact that environment does trigger and open things up in mm -hmm. the genome. Things that may have already been there or began to be programmed in suddenly became active and not all of those active things, were, and contrary to evolutionary standards, they weren't good uh, acting necessarily. They were bad ones and, and, right. and they caused lifespans to decrease. And the Bible, the record, it doesn't tell you why it happens. It's just straightforward is short recur recording that lifespans are decreasing. You're going from 950 in Noah, then 600 for Shem, 400 and some for Arfax had. Then you go down to two by, by ten Peleg is here. He dies at 235. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's still a man. I'd like to live 235. You know, we're looking at right now, man, that'd be great to live 235 mm -hmm. years. We're like, if we get him 100, if somebody gets to be 120, he's he's in every record book in the world. You know what I'm saying? And uh, pretty much most most people are dead by the mid 80s or 90s. And that's a, that's a good life. You now, know? what you were talking about, you know, that there are certain things that switch on and off. Yes. And we're, uh, they're starting to figure out what that is, and they're calling it epigenetics. Epigenetics, correct. Epigenetics is uh, a methylation uh, which uh, uh, either is present or absent on, on a uh, on, uh, part of the genome, and it uh, turn, it's a, acts as a switch. It turns it on. It turns that's it what off. I was getting at. And so um, what that does is that uh, it accounts for things like uh, 
uh, if you, you know, people who live in higher altitudes don't get altitude sickness because they right. they get used to it, and it's because the methylation turns on the genetic switches that were already programmed in the genes to do this. Right. And so there are you know, things the creator already built in, and you know the you know the things that you know, mutations do is uh, it uh, will damage certain pieces of this so that that's this, right and and, uh, and so mutations are is never a good thing it's uh, uh, you know they talk about beneficial mutations I'd like to know what what they're talking about what well I, I we've talked about this a little beneficial mutations are in certain environments certain things uh, there's a create off. an advantage but they're never in, by an increase in genetic information, which is what evolution demands. I don't want to get too complicated there, but for those who watch the show, in other words, a blind fish in a black cave or dark cave, that's an advantage because you don't get eye infections, okay? You don't get the problems. But in a seeing eye world, you know what a blind fish is? Food. <laughs> you know, they're food. It's the same thing. Uh, people can say a beneficial mutation with sickle, the people who have uh, a defective uh, sickle cell anemia, they don't get malaria in Africa, mm -hmm. but they're sickly. Who thinks that that's beneficial? Yes, in that particular s strain of environment. Uh, again, uh, talk about the, the damaged uh, bacteria in hospitals, okay? Mm -hmm. they, they, they survive, they're, very, they're much more virulent, but they have a damaged uh, um, uh, nutrition uh, absorption system. Yeah, so they don't absorb the antibiotics the same way. Right. So in a sterile environment, those have an advantage. They can live and the other ones are who need the food, who to, they'll die. So they have advantage, but they're all de they're definitely not beneficial as far as the, the health of the mm -hmm. cell or the organism that's going on, and that's what I think when they talk about beneficial mutations, Doug. I've never seen anything other than that. What they really want you to believe is to make the leap that this benefit, this mutation, has made something better than it was before, and it never has. Mm -hmm. What it's allowed you to do is adapt in certain limited environments, and that can be beneficial, but it's not healthier for the organism. So that's, a, that's another No, let's get off the rabbit trail and get back on I know, that. but it is fascinating because mm -hmm. we're watching this go down to, so Pele, what happens in his day, Doug? Well, the earth was divided. Yeah, and we have all kinds of people think, uh, there are all kinds of scenarios in this. Basically, uh, there was some kind of, uh, uh, there, there might have been some kind of a physical earthquake involved, but I think it's primarily, most people primarily think it has to do with the division of languages. So this would have been right. and this, this. When you look at the ad, the addition, the genealogy, the time frame of Peleg, it would have been about the Tower of Time of Babel. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of creationists who uh, try to fit the continental uh, split at this point in time. Yeah, this reminds me, Doug, of the people who put a, a pre-Adamic flood. You know, mm -hmm. the, the 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 gap between Genesis one one and one two. It's amazing how people put things in that the. I mean, Scripture talks about it all in the Noah's flood. Everything's destroyed. The, you know, the, the flood water, I mean, the whole earth is, and then they, they would rather ignore that and put it in a post-flood episode mm -hmm. or a pre-creation pre episode. And I go, the Bible doesn't really talk about those. And I, I don't have a problem, Doug, that there might have been a physical sign at the time of the splitting of the languages. I don't, because people were basically in one place. Mm -hmm. At that time, they were in the Mesopotamian Valley, and perhaps there might have been a large earthquake during in the mess. I'm not saying there was. I don't know. I don't have any uh, any knowledge of that for one way or the other. Well, but it wouldn't have been a worldwide words. The earth was divided. It's, yeah. uh, I think it creates a whole lot more uh, uh, heat than light in terms of uh, Absolutely. trying to figure out what, if uh, something really significant happened at that time. Um, I think there would have been a whole lot more said about it. In this but it is true, though, Doug. In those in these early parts of Genesis, these first eleven chapters. It's very, the Bible is very sparse. It the Noah is amazing because there's that much information given. Right. But almost nobody else is given more than a line or two. Seth gives a couple lines, Enoch gives a line. Mm -hmm. uh, you get this Pele, in his days the earth were divided. That's kind of like, ooh, that, that does challenge you to well, what are you talking about? But I believe the, the primary focus is the division of the world into different people groups. Uh, based on language, okay? Right, and then we're on the Tower of Babel. And, uh, Tower of Babel and, All that uh, stuff, yeah. And yep. that uh, makes a lot of sense uh, in terms of explaining right. how the languages uh, got dispersed. Right, know. what's fascinating, Doug, is that Noah had 17 grandsons. And I've read, and, and I don't, I'm not dogmatic about this, it's just kind of a little 
to pique your curiosity and go ahead and research it. I may be full of hot air, but there are there are many researchers who believe that you can you can consolidate all the languages that we have today into 17 different groups. Okay, mm -hmm. I find that fascinating, Doug. That 17 languages in Noah had 17 grandsons, and that would have been the time of the Tower of Babel. At that, that time, would, would okay? the time of Nimrod been been the time of Pele? Yes. Right around yeah, that. So that would, yeah. would make sense that yes. they would uh, equivocate the two. That's what I'm saying. And, I, and this is just speculative, absolutely admitting that. But it makes, it, it is not unreasonable, okay? And I think it's fun to do those kinds of things. I don't think it's wrong to do it, as long as you don't rest a whole the theology on something like that. Like I say, I don't have a problem that there might have been a major earthquake in the Mesopotamian Valley at the time of the Tower of Babel. But am I saying that it happened and that, or that, that, that's, is that, it's not a worldwide continental divide thing. That would have been Noah's flood and, right. and, and some of the aftershocks perhaps after that. But And that's why I say there could have been some aftershocks even as late as the time of Moses. There probably was still some things going on as the world was settling. But, so, so you have Rio and you have Sirug and then you have Nahor, Nahor. and then Terra and then Abram. Abram. Yep. And those are the the ancestors of Abram, and uh, they, there's not much mentioned in the scriptures about them, except that they... Uh, I'm going to give you a little, this is, Philip Morrow puts it together, and he re really bases it on Anstey's book, and I think it's really, really good, the way he does this, from the flood to Abram. Um, and he says here, he says, um, uh, this brings us to 11, Genesis 11, 26, and, uh, and basically uh, the birth of Terah, uh, Nahor was 29 when Terah was born, um, but it says that Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So that's, remember they went to say Noah was 500 years and he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Mm -hmm. So it's very, there's a very simple similarity here. Um, but this does not state the year of Terah's life in which Abram was born. Okay? Terah and begat Nahor? I thought Nahor was I'm sorry, this, uh, the year, uh, I'm sorry, it's not they state the year of Terah's life in which, era, in which Abram was born. Yeah, Nahor, Nahor was was the one, oh yeah, but no, Terah was the one that birthed uh, Abram, okay? Uh, which must be ascertained in order that we may connect the generations of Abraham with what went before. How is this necessary information to be supplied? And he gives it, because this usher really figured this out, mm -hmm. okay? As in the parallel case of the, the sons of Noah, where Shem is named first, not because he is the oldest son, but because he is the one through whom God's purpose was to be accomplished, so of the sons of Terah, Abram is, meant, is first mentioned, though not the oldest son. From Genesis 11.32, we learn that Terah, Abram's father, died in Haran at the age of 205 years. The following verse, Genesis 12.1, should be read as a continuation of this, and without the word had, for which there is no warrant in the, in the, in the original Hebrew. For it appears by the wording of the, of the narrative, as well as by Stephen's word in the New Testament, Acts 7.4, that God gave two direct, distinct calls to Abram. In response to the first call, he went only so far as to Haran. Interesting, one of the sons of of Terah, of, of Terah was named Haran, but that's where that, and that's where they, was that, that's the name of a place. But it says, and he continued to abide until the death of his father. Therefore, Genesis eleven thirty two and what follows should be read thus: And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died in Haran. And the Lord said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and so from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed out of Haran. And that gives us the mission information, okay? From this, it appears that Terah died at the age of 205, that upon the death of Terah, Abram departed out of Haran, being then 75 years old. Mm -hmm. If then Abram was 75 years old at the death of Terah, the latter, that is Terah, was 130 years of age when Abram was born. Okay? This enables us to complete the table of the generations of Shem as follows. So Terah was born in 1878. We had Terah's age at the birth of Abram, which is 130, and Abram was born in the year 2000, year 2008. Okay, I have a question okay. for you, Rich. Yes. Um, if uh, Abram was born uh, when Terah was 130 years old, right. why was Ab Abraham sweating the fact that uh, he wasn't didn't having a kid at, at 100. Year. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I thought the same thing. The reason why I think is basically things are already, uh, he lived to 205, Abram already lived, uh, he lived to be 175. Mm -hmm. 
And what's interesting is he had many kids after when he married Keturah. Right. After Sarah died, she was 127. The only woman I think mentioned in the Bible of the age of her death, how old she was at her death. And he has kids with with uh, with um, with uh, Keturah. And it may have been because he knew Sarah was not able to conceive. Right. Yeah, as yeah, much as he was, he was probably uh, uh, no, wondering, you know, expecting that Sarah would conceive much right. earlier. And, and, and there was no children at all. Where Terah lived 40 years longer, number one. Number two, he already had two kids before mm -hmm. Abram. And Abraham might have been born by a second wife. There mm -hmm. seems to be an indication in Scripture that it might have been a second wife. In fact, I think he even mentions that here. It says, um, the lateness of Abraham's birth um, uh, in the life of his father explains how he could only be 10 years older than his half-niece, Sarah, or Ishka, Genesis 11:29. And therefore of an age to marry her, notwithstanding that he belonged to a generation earlier than that to which he belonged, Sarah married her father Haran's much younger brother. And similarly, Milcah, Sarah's sister, married her, fa married her father Haran's brother Nahor. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Abram was probably Terah's son by a second wife. If so, this would explain how Abram could say to Abimelech, she is the daughter of my father Terah, but not of my mother. Okay, yeah. so that, that that's means, interesting. Yeah, yeah. You can, uh, with the people living so long, you, you know, it's possible that they, they would have had uh, maybe a dozen wives during their lifetime. You know? uh, possible. And interestingly enough, the 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 age of the birth uh, was still, you know, it's even before the the the, the antediluvian patriarchs and then the the post um it goes from an average of about yeah, 65, 70 years. Of age for the average down to about 30 years mm -hmm. so it cuts in half of when their first mm -hmm. child is generally born but Abram was the third was probably the, the youngest of the three mm -hmm. so it's fascinating though there's a there's a parallelism there you get three sons and you have to fill in the blanks with other, other scriptures same thing with same thing with Abram does the same thing up until this point as we said before all the lineage really even though there's there's little tricks there mm -hmm. Usher and other chronologists figured it out and better, better people than I, than me, I would have taken me a while to figure that out, have gotten it, and it's, it's, and it's an unbroken chain when you put it together, and, and it's all through individuals up to this point. Now yeah, we're going to start going to something else. It's an puzzle to, to figure out, isn't it? Pretty? It's fascinating, especially when you know the purpose of, of the chronology is about redemption. It's, it's not right. really about numbers. Otherwise, you could have picked any other genealogies, and, and they and they and they, they and, only pick one. And, uh, and it makes sense. It uh, holds uh, fast to what we understand from the scripture and history and science. Uh, and uh, you know, if it uh, like I like I said before, if it had worked out that the uh, Methuselah had died after the flood, yeah, yeah. I, I, I uh, when, when, when <laughs> I was running my spreadsheet numbers, and I said, oh, it works. Yeah. We'll, we'll see you next time on Revolution Against Evolution.